Hello, friends, and welcome to Talking with Famous People. I'm your exciting host, Host Eric. And today, as always, my job, it's an easy one, really, is to excite you with exciting things. I was born spewing exciting things from my mouth, so it's not a big challenge for me to be exciting like this. Um... If you're feeling extraordinarily excited right now, don't be surprised. It's okay. It's normal. It's par for the course here at Talking With Famous People. I think I should probably move a little bit further to the right. Yeah. There you go. There, that'll do. Well, the, I'm going to have to adjust the filter a little bit. That's just life in the OBS land, I guess. I think I should make it... A little less smooth. A little more meow. That's pretty good. Can't see my shirt, but now a little bit more smooth. I guess that's about as good as it's gonna get. Maybe I could change the kind of light. Well, that seems to help. Okay, here I am. Hi, Winston's mom. Who says, hi, Rachel Apolos, and hi, host Eric Perfect Time, and I'm ready to hang out and chill now. What's neat in you? Well, this video was prompted in large part by, uh, I didn't watch the live stream this morning, or last night, I mean, of Brenner, uh, Brenner's typing, because I was napping. But I this morning, I went through and looked at the, why is this so... I'm having issues with this mic right now. Hold on. Mic check. Hmm. The levels here on this mic are not nearly as high as they should be given what I have it on the settings wise. So I don't know what to make about that. I think I just need to probably unplug the sound card and stuff. Regardless, if you can hear me okay, then that's fine. Hi, Chris at LP. Um, so, while I was looking at the chat of the live stream of the typing of Brenner, I noted uh, Legends Fall. Legends Fall indicating that he saw a lot of FI in this person. And then the other person I heard, I saw indicating this was Sheila. Now, Legends Fall and I are in full agreement about his type. Uh, he's an ESTP. So, my advice to people who are FI polar at least, but probably to FE people in general, is don't look for FI. Look for the absence of FE or the alternative to FE. It's really difficult for people to identify FI in part because it's not. it doesn't have a strong correlate with displays consistently all fi people have to shift into some sort of social behavior in order to engage with the world and so it's a little bit harder to note or identify in their affect fi sometimes now sometimes you get stereotypical fi affect like you know enfps tend to always look and sound like they're about to cry um but that's not always the case and it depends on the context right so uh um the other person who, who was I saying, I definitely see FI here, was Sheila. Now, Sheila says she's an ISFP. I think she's an ISFJ, and I've said so all along. And um, because of a couple reasons. One, she's pretty clearly FE, and two, she's uh, pretty clearly not any polar. 
So, um, the thing is, Legends Fall and Sheila, in my mind, both exemplify that what happens when FE people look for FI thinking they know what it is. Especially FE Polar. Um, I don't typically spend a lot of time looking for FI directly. I look for the alternative to FE. I look, I look for not FE when I should get FE. Uh, that's a good sign to me that it's FI. I look for TE instead of FE. That's a good sign that... Um, or TE instead of TI. That's a good sign that they're FI, you know. But I, I find it very difficult. FI is the, one of the more difficult functions to test directly. SE is probably the most difficult function to test directly. But, um... But, uh... FI certainly is as well. So, the thing about FI is... It's a subjective experience plus a subjective deliberation, both of which are manifesting attentionally on the internal fields primarily. Now, those internal fields, when I'm feeling strong emotions, will spill over into natural, unconstructed displays of emotion. But distinguishing between constructed displays of emotion and unconstructed displays of emotion can be very difficult. I'm going to try this like this. Does this make the sound better or worse? Can somebody give me a little audio feedback? I'd appreciate it. Did I ever watch your INFJ video? I said you saw no SI from me. Um, I mean, no, I, I don't, I don't really recall, uh, our conversations very much. I just recall that what I concluded was that you were FE, not FI, you know, and that you disagreed that you weren't, and that, and that you weren't any polar. Those are the two conclusions I remember drawing about you was that you were FE and not not any polar. INFJ fits that category and so does ISFJ. Uh, the point is, what I'm trying to get at here is not about you, Sheila. It's about this. what happens when FE people, regardless of whether you are one or not, Sheila, certainly Legends Fall is, and certainly I am, when we look, try to look for FI explicitly or say, I see FI, we're going about it the wrong way. We need to say, do I see FE? Or do I see something else that determines FI? Because FI is very hard to spot directly. Everybody has some emotional displays. People could look at my emotional displays, especially when I'm like upset about something, angry or ranting, and say, boy, that's a lot of F, right? That's a lot of emotion. It's not a lot of emotion. It's a lot of expressiveness in communication. And it represents a, an amount of emotion that may or may not correlate with what you're seeing expressed. As someone who's FI polar, I don't naturally see expressions of emotion and communication as being expressions of emotion in the self, but rather as part of the communicative process. In other words, one uses emotions to communicate certain things, not to feel them or experience them. Well, okay, but the thing is this. I agree with you, Sheila W., that... From, if you are right and you are ISFP, it would make sense that you'd be much better at spotting FI. And that's the other half of this is that uh, FI people tend to be a lot better at spotting FI than FE people do. The thing is, about that guy yesterday, Brenner, you were wrong. And almost everybody agrees with me that you were wrong. He's not FI Dom. He's definitely not an FI user at all. He's definitely FE. So if the thing you are saying, aha, see, FI. If you're, if you're right and identifying something, you've misnamed it FI, it's actually FE. How does an INFJ figure out their FI? Rachel, you want to field that question? It's funny, I've been thinking about my sixth slot. FI a lot. You may have trouble hearing her, I'll sort of repeat what she says for you. Physically, it goes to my SI, I guess. I don't know, but um, it's, it's, 
I think most of the most of the what I would deem examples of negative FI from you link to people imposing expectations on you that you don't want imposed on you. Yes. <laughs> so the thing is that's and the thing is as a, an FI polar type, I'm probably about as good at spotting FI as it is, what it is, as any FI as any FI polar type could be. But even so, um, the thing I'm noting is behind what she's saying, right? It's still something I'm having to infer. So when she says yesterday, um, in kind of a, a a tone of voice that that makes me go, okay, <laughs> watch out here, watch this, see what's gonna go down. When she warns me that she's not in a very talkative mood and don't expect her to to be particularly chatty at lunch or whatever. What she's really saying is, I, I resent that I'm having to go to this right now. I, it's not in my, it's not consistent with my mood on identity placement in the moment. And uh, so, you know, watch out, don't place any additional burdens on me. You're getting from me something that I'm having to sacrifice, which is not how it should be anyway. Which in general is true, you know. Um, it shouldn't be the case that parties have to sacrifice to be in a relationship, no matter what other people say, right? Uh, that's commonly thought to be the case. Well, you need to compromise to be in a relationship. Well, compromise means each party sacrifices something. By and large, a good relationship doesn't involve either party sacrificing anything because there's a good, uh, a good match. Going through your body equals psychosomatic symptoms. No, I mean, your emotions, the, the emotion, the feeling in your body of emotions is not psychosomatic. It's an actual feeling, right? Like uh, if I get a lump in the throat for, because I'm about to cry, that's a real physical feeling. It's not um, imagined. Uh, if my heart races because I'm excited about something, it's a real physical feeling. It's not imagined. <laughs> Do you have advice for an ISFJ and ISFP relationship, good communication and longevity? ISFJ, ISFP, huh? Mm -hmm. Huh. That's I have good. to think about it for a second. Uh, really good, uh, see what this, okay. Yeah. There's, well, I'll tell you this, there's very little extroverted intuition going on in that couple, right? One of them's fuller, one of them's fourth. Um... But only Alice, I would suggest that what I just demonstrated regarding Rachel's like two sentences of negativity yesterday demonstrates what normally is the in the INFJ wheelhouse. To to note mia being said and spoken in such a tone and to determine what it really represents underneath, and then to say nothing in response. That's that's the INFJ uh, way, and it's something that I'm pretty damn good at given that I'm an ENTP. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of myself for that, you know? Mostly only only INFJs do that shit. Interesting. So it's like quasi-identical relations. Quasi-identical, huh? Um, Is there a quick way to figure out whether you're an actually an INFJ? Yep. Simply book a slot with Host Eric for $100, and in one hour I will determine and tell you your type. I will do so by probing who you are with questions, follow-up questions, queries, skills tests, and such. One of the things I noted yesterday in the live chat uh, that I want to correct, TI questions are not IQ test questions. They are not intelligence questions. In fact, the IQ test that I last took had zero such questions on it. Zero. Zero. It is not the case that introverted thinking questions are just IQ test questions that are unrelated to cognitive functions, which is what people sometimes think they are. Right now, I am dealing with waiting on an ENFP who is struggling with the decision about whether to publish the video of me typing her because she says, you know, the, the couple of TI questions I asked her, I only asked like two of them, make her her inability to address them or answer them makes her look dumb right but the thing is she's not dumb and you know what often happens with enfps is they'll say things like i'm not dumb i'm in mensa um well that's because ti doesn't correlate very strongly with intelligence 
it correlates strongly with introverted thinking and ENFPs are introverted thinking polar. So no, those are not IQ test questions. To the extent that they're on the IQ test, that's what's wrong with the IQ test. IQ, the idea that there's a general composite intelligence that we can label and mean something by is silly. So, um, you know, I, uh, I'll get that link for that. Thanks for reminding me. Um, it's frustrating for me to, to see now how clearly what I too used to conflate as intelligence is just a, one of the most relentless, uh, campaigns of ontological assault committed by one group of attentional manners against people of another throughout history. That's what TI questions being thought of as intelligence are, is it comprises NTP's ontological assault on the world that's continued for millennia. Um, what am I looking for? Oh yeah. So it's like cognitive functions is the answer to that. Why are, why are you smart but bad at TI questions? Because TI isn't smart, it's TI, right? It's that simple. It really is that simple. Like I'm not an idiot, even though I make what could only be called idiotic decisions historically when it comes to relationships, my own boundaries, etc. But it's wrong to conflate that I'm bad at that particular attentional manner or don't use that attentional manner to good effect, that I'm therefore stupid. I'm looking for the link I'm looking for. I'm reading. Boy, New Jack. <laughs> New Jack's quite a character. Quite an interesting fellow. So thoroughly, uh, so thoroughly determined not to get out intuited by anyone ever in any context. <laughs> that his intuition's playing him silly. I don't know if that's going to work or not because it's got a dot 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 on it. I like New Jack too. The thing is, he's affording me way too much credit part of the time. <laughs> in that, like, I, I'm i not, the thing, I it is in theory that I could have done the thing I did for some, for some secret, intuitive, anticipatory, how the other guy's going to act kind of thing, but it's not the case <laughs> even though it could be it's not so um, at that point your your proactive defense against one person out intuiting you and then eventually going haha is completely unwarranted <laughs> I have no interest in doing that and I that I just just not how I roll you know Oh, did I study psychology or philosophy at university? Um, no, not really. I, uh, I mean, in general, the amount of stuff that I learned in college <sighs> represents a tiny fraction of the stuff that I've learned. So, in other words, I found college one of the least efficient ways to learn anything that I've ever experienced. I mean, except for, like, high school. <laughs> Both of those things are extraordinarily inefficient ways to learn things. Uh, it's like they're based on the idea that you don't actually know what you want to learn or why you want to learn it. You talk in layman's terms about how you experience FI. Yeah, sure. Uh, I am moved by things, you know. I'm moved by things a lot. So I'm moved a lot by things that happen in anime. When I was watching this Ragnarok show... Uh, on Netflix and it showed the succession of battles between humanity and the gods and and you know the various statements that humans say about don't underestimate us humans makes me go uh, 
boo hoo hoo or whatever. It is absolutely not the case that I uh, I generated everything that I talk about as an idea. The key teaching thing for me has been being a debate coach. So being a debate coach means I've spent many years cutting philosophers into debate cards and cutting social scientists and cutting other people who publish and are show up on Google Scholar, right? So I, and also being a debate coach means I understand the full scope and scale of argumentation. Whatever argument you might make in whatever context, it already fits into an existing taxonomy and model that's complete regarding rhetoric and argumentation. Even if you come up with something entirely new, it'll still fit into a category that exists and can be dealt with at the category level. Um, it's always possible to come up with new precise warrants, like um, something that happened yesterday is evidence of meh. Well, that's a new warrant in the sense that it just happened yesterday. But the link that you're making between the event and either causality or impacts or whatever kind of link it is, is always going to be one of those kind of arguments. So in reading about cognitive functions then, I approached it as I would a debate coach. I'm very practiced in doing two things. Quickly finding the actual, what they're actually saying, because usually an argument's buried in a big pile of words around it that mean nothing. But you know, finding the words that actually say what the warrant is, or noting that there is no actual warrant, so it's worthless, just garbage, or also dismissing everything that's not is not going to be sustainable without really even understanding why. It's an intuitive thing at this point. Like I can say, okay, that argument's not sustainable. That's not, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not. Just boom. Destroy 99 one hundredths of any given thing, but I'll find the one thing that is a legitimate warrant and I'll take it with me. And so that's how come I've, I've correctly now finally, uh, I've created a place where people can correctly talk about cognitive functions. It's not because I came up with all these ideas myself. I have no idea where they all came from, you know? Some of them are my, of my own generation. But, um, and some of the key ones are, but that's what happens when there's a gaping hole in a puzzle that you put together almost all the pieces of, right? It's pretty obvious what shape that the missing piece is. You argue that my framework for that stance is bias. Um, I mean, if you were to argue that my framework for that stance is bias, then you'd have to argue that I was, you'd have to point to specific arguments that I was ignoring or sidestepping or um, not answering or that we're defeating things that I'm saying that are extant that uh, in that case you'd say bias sure because in that case I'd be choosing not, I'd be straw manning basically I'd be choosing to avoid the strongest arguments I don't like weakness in my own case so that's not the case right um, if I'm smarter than Michelle shocked right um, when I pointed out that Michelle Shock's safety net of, of internet iron fistery had a big hole in it called the Internet Archive, she didn't thank me, she attacked me, right? I'm not like Michelle Shocked. When somebody points out there's a big hole in my armor, I thank them. Please describe it further. When somebody points out what's wrong, I thank them. Please explicate. How, I, you're right, I was wrong. I need to fix what's wrong. That's my way. That, that's why. That's why you're wrong about what you're saying. It's not a bias-based thing because that my way is literally the, the death, fire, smash, guillotine, kill machine of bias. It's my way every day, all day. So the good news is together, when we focus on things that are objectively sustainable, you don't have to worry about me, right? And my state of mind, am I biased or not biased or whatever? You don't have to worry about it because it's all there for everyone to evaluate. So if you think I'm typing people wrong, well, watch a bunch of my typing sessions and come here and say, here are things you are doing wrong and why. Well, then we can have an actual conversation. You're not, really believing that 
it's my bias that causes me to talk like this. Really, you're believing that my talking like this is something that needs to be taken down a notch, and this is your attempt to do so. That's my interpretation of it. Who's right? I don't know, because neither of us are talking about anything real, right? We're talking about effy shit. Hi, Eric. How can I learn about your theory of cognitive functions and acquire the essential skill of ideas so that I can determine for myself whether the theory makes sense without overlooking ideas? Well, I haven't exactly made it easy. There is a book called uh, Exciting Tables and Words About Human Personality, although it's a bit old, uh, a bit dated, and not, not doesn't really have the most, the most correct understanding of things, but that's worth looking at. Um, there are several videos where I attempt to say, look, here's the overview for people who are quick learners and understand things quickly. And I couldn't exactly point you to one of them without doing a little searching, but there are such videos. The thing to remember is this. The model is predicated on one. If, you, if you're going to model a, an agent that is taking free will style action, in other words, that's acting not, a, not according to a pre-programmed set of instructions that tells to go meow, 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 but instead acting in accordance with rules that are determined as attentional manners. If you're going to simulate something like that, then um, we need to have a few things in place. We need to have a prime directive. What's the one prime directive that subsumes all cognitive functions? And that prime directive is map and territory uh, con confluence. So when your map, which tells you what to expect, is proven wrong by the territory, which surprises you, especially in ways you don't like, Unless you're expecting to be surprised, right? In which case, it's not really a surprise. That creates a dissonance that people need to avoid and try to solve. So the attentional configurations then represent different strategies towards that purpose. Uh, and the other thing we're going to need to do if we need to model it, we need to uh, define frames, uh, fields, and objects. So frames being the grammar that, that objects on fields operate under. So we do have distinctly, observationally, and I've never heard anybody meaningfully dispute this statement. We observationally, it is observationally so, we have four distinct fields. The field we're dealing with right now is called the external metaphysical field. It's about words and meanings being exchanged, not about the spatial experiences of the entities exchanging the words. It occurs on a turn-based level, that is to say, after I'm done talking, you could respond and then I could respond, blah, 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 blah. And it is turn-based also because it doesn't matter how long it takes me to express a thought, the thought's the same, right? It's not durationally impacted. Your perceptions of it may change, but the meaning of the words, the locutionary meaning of the words remains the same. So we do have an external metaphysical field, it's indisputable, it's called the internet. We have an internal metaphysical field, that is say we remember things, can think and not talk out loud and not share. We have a private intellect and a private set of self-concept and such like that internal metaphysical field. It's also true that we have a body where we can experience something like a stomach ache. That's our internal physical field. And it's furthermore true that there's a world of objects out here that we can bump into. That's the external physical field. Nobody's ever meaningfully explained to me any possible alternative to those, the, to those four fields, although I didn't get the concepts from anywhere. Does FI make FE users annoyed? I mean, to be perfectly honest, it's the FE that annoys me. Um, it may or may not be FE utilized by FE, by FE people or FI people, but you want to know what annoys me? Um, people coming in, expressing negative perceptions or opinions about me or what I'm doing without any warrants. In other words, they're merely trying to F.E. position me as wrong, as me as wrong, rather than dealing with anything I'm saying directly. That annoys me. That should annoy you. I just need to probably listen to this. Eric, does ducks shit everywhere linguistically imply that there exists no duck such that duck doesn't shit everywhere? Is there an implicit all? No. I mean, okay, so on the locutionary frame, it would literally be taken to mean 
on a TI level that that any any individual instance of a duck will also be an instance of shits everywhere, okay? But the, when you include the illocutionary frame, what's clearly happening there is you're trying to tell somebody who is considering getting ducks one of the consequences of getting ducks, namely that there will be duck shit everywhere that you have to clean up or leave. Um, so in, our, in other words, in order to correctly understand communication, we have to include the illocutionary context or else we'll just be, we're, we're in the straw man business, right? You said duck shit everywhere. These ducks haven't shit inside my bedroom. Liar. No, well, that's not what I meant. I meant, you know, the problem with having ducks is they shit everywhere. <laughs> I don't mean it literally. I mean, they don't shit in one place specifically. They don't always, always go to one place to shit. And they shit frequently. That's what I mean, right? I don't admire people. I admire, I admire ideas. So even if there are philosophers who have a lot of good ideas, I admire those ideas. I don't admire the people because that's missing the point, right? To the extent that a, a philosopher deserves credit or admiration, it's not because they're a good guy or something. It's just because their idea has proved ro robust. Which ideas do I admire? Um, well, even then admire is a weird word. Where do I take a lot of good ideas from is linguistics. I take the, the I take many good ideas from linguistics because ultimately, no matter what we're examining, observing, analyzing, 90% of that process is going to involve language. In other words, no matter what the action is, what it is, is determined by language, not by the action itself. So, uh, but there's this other guy, I wish I could remember his name, he's fairly famous. Um, he's the guy I got the idea of the, um, the prime directive from. He doesn't talk about it as a prime directive, and he phrases it somewhat differently. He doesn't talk about map territory or whatever. But his, the gist of what he's saying is that the fundamental drive behind all life is to reduce free energy, which is to say, um, like, a... a a disparateness between what's required of the moment and time and what's available to you. <clears throat> Something like that. But, you know, you have to you have to look up the guy and read him. He's a famous genius, okay? So, unlike me, who has no such status, when people don't understand him, people assume that they are wrong. <laughs> when people don't understand me, they assume I'm wrong. That's the benefit of having status of, of like a world known genius or something, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. How does linguistics influence your typology? Um, well, I recognize, first of all, that I'm a very language heavy type. So that I'm handicapped as a typologist when dealing with people who are non-native speakers of English. Um, it Sometimes it can be very difficult for me to type somebody if their English isn't good enough because I rely so much on language. Now, somebody who was attempting to rely on more physical cues would maybe have an easier time typing that person, but would still end up with the same fundamental problem that they'll always end up with, which is they can't justify it. They can say this physical cue I saw and this physical cue I saw, but they can't justify it in the sense of well, why does that physical cue uh, indicate strongly meow or meow? The most advanced civilizations in the universe will be indistinguishable from nature. Right, so you could think of all of nature as being um, a system that self-extinguishes free energy. 
What do you think about ENTPs growing up with three different languages and the nature of any manifesting itself on a figurative at abstract level rather than on a literal level? Well, I mean, it, it, it manifests on multiple levels. So extroverted intuition, in part, as an agent, it's a, it's a strong valuing of novelty and it means easily getting bored. Uh, that's extroverted intuition, not as it's paying attention, but as it manifests as a human being's identity. You know, it's a, it's a different frame of reference in that context. As a value, extroverted intuition is mostly against doing the same thing because you've done it that way before without questioning whether it could it's the best way or a better, there could be a better way, you know? Um, and these are general sort of timeless states of beings, where unlike an attentional manner, which is always manifest across time, it uses time to attend to something. Conclusions, stasises, statuses that we can reference, those um, are ways that we compact our attentional time spent into a little meaning package so that we can incur the rewards of that invested time again and again. Um, so then in the abstract, it's, it's not about what language you're using, or it's about how you're using language to shortcut future deliberative processes, how you're using language to undercut the certainty of other people's words and ideas, and um, just generally how you're using language to disrupt uh, disrupt the stasis of those who have a more static relationship with language. Hi, Lijo. I don't know if you noticed, but I, uh, I was so taken with your analogy, I put it up on my my community tab is a picture. Lijo's analogy was uh, bands talking politics during shows. It's like I ordered lobster and it comes with peas on top. Yeah, I get it's extra, but it's not what I paid for. <laughs> <laughs> um, something like that. Yes, yeah, good. I paraphrased it a bit, but. Can you name a concrete example where a sentence would integrate a type? No, not definitively. For sure not. There are sentences that go along with types more strongly than others. For example, I like to ask this question. Which of the following sentences do you, do you identify with more? Oh, we're going to a party at Joe's house tonight? Oh, I hope it's okay. You know how fussy Jolene can get and Ronald. I mean, I'll be fine, but you know how those people are. They, they're so fussy about every little thing. Or... You identify with this sentence. Uh, oh, we're going to Joe's house for Friday night? Yeah, well, Josephine may be fussy and somebody rolling, but fuck those people. I'm worried about how I'm going to feel. I know from the past that I haven't always felt good at these parties. Which, which one of those do you identify with more is one way to check for FEFI. It's not determinate, though. In other words, I'm looking for a lot of different things that are indeterminate, and seeing if this pile is huge of indeterminate things and this pile is very small of indeterminate things, that's a pretty strong indicator of determination. But by in and of itself, that sentence might be interpreted by different people in different ways. The problem with talking is what I mean by a given word and what you understand by a given word are different things to some extent. And also, even if we have the same fundamental understanding of the meanings of the words, we understand words differently in different contexts and we may understand the context differently. So, um, in other words, people hear things under the frame of reference of expecting what they're hearing to be purposed by the other person in mia fashion. One of the reasons I'm a good typologist is when I ask questions, people can't really tell why I'm asking them um, unless they're very experienced viewers of my typing sessions. And even then, knowing that, I'll ask a different, I'll turn them around a bit and be looking for a different kind of thing accordingly. So I'm intuitive enough, intuitive enough generally to stay a step, a, a step or two ahead of the person I'm typing. And if I'm not, 
that's a very clear indication that they are down to one of two possible types, basically. So, um, maybe one of three, maybe one of four, I don't know. But you can eliminate most types if, in fact, that's the case. So what is the relationship between the free energy principle and typology? Well, the free energy principle basically says if there's a, a big, fat, healthy deer in every way, shape, or form, but it has a broken leg, then the big, fat, health part of it comprises what we might call free energy. It's like um, there's all this health, but no place for it to go because it can't convert it into running because it's got a broken leg. So nature cleans up that free energy. That's the first wolf, that's the first deer the wolves eat, right? Um, so the thing is about typology, how does it link? Basically, what I'm saying is that free energy in human beings is manifest when our map and territories don't agree with each other. So that's why what will elicit a strong response from somebody. What? But you said, in other words, you set the following expectations and now the territory has changed. I'm upset. Um, if, if people get suddenly put into a situation or not even not suddenly put into a situation where they, their, their map and territory confluence are irrelevant, such as a war zone, they come back deeply traumatized from it. If they grow up in a situation where they cannot develop a map in which the territory is in any way friendly to them, they end up traumatized and having BPD. So the, the absolutely prime directive then is map territory confluence. And the 16, the 16 uh, personality types each represents a strategy towards attaining that. And any Dom wants to make sure they're not surprised by things on the map, things things on the territory that the map failed to anticipate, okay? So what they do is they try to map out not just what is, but what might be and what should be and how and why. And um, that way, even if shit goes down bad, they say, oh, well, I did, I did account for that in map 17A, at least. That may not be the map I'm looking at right now, but at least I have it in my archive of maps. Um, so that causes causes the ENTP to feel less pain when the territory disagrees with the map, provided they have actually thought about it. Now, the very worst experience is if you're totally caught off guard. So why do you think people um, why do you think people play detective with their significant others? Like, are you cheating? Let me look at your phone. That kind of shit. Because they would much rather um, your, your partner be cheating on you, but you know about it before they know you know about it, than your partner cheating on you and it coming as a complete shock to you. Right? It's a huge difference. And yet, it's no difference at all. The partner's doing the same thing. It's all about map and territory. Eric, isn't it more meaningful to compare FE to TE and FI to TI? FE and FI are different by substance, not by shape. Well, the reason you're not comparing the two, per se, is if I note conscious FE, then I can logically deduce unconscious FI. I don't have to pay any attention to FI at all to know that it's on the back slot if I can, if I can clearly determine that FE is on the front side. Same with TI. The fact is the best two to differentiate between are in fact FI and TI, but um, the problem with that is that uh, because TI is such a simple function, in other words, it you it is the most easily easily defined function. It has the narrowest scope of operation, and it deals with the most low resolution kind of data, namely words in their binary forms or other symbols in their binary forms. So because of that. You know, you could, everybody can do some TI except for polar. And eighth slot can be quite strong at passing those tests. So even though TI skills tests are a great way to distinguish FI polar, they're not a great way to tell you whether somebody's a TI front stack or back stack. It's easier to see 
whether somebody's F-E or T-E, um, and deduce the other things. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions. If you get somebody who's T-I polar, the, the T-I tests are great. If you get somebody that's uh, F-I polar, it's a little harder to be determinate about, but it can be pretty obvious. Regardless, you're not really comparing against two things, right? You're looking for one thing or the absence of it and drawing the necessary deductive conclusion from that first conclusion. Uh, Elijah, that's what I thought too. I thought the ferrum form sounded adorable, the ferret form. I went there, I was mauled mercilessly. So, you know, ferrets sound cute. They're actually like little wolverines. Uh, I had to get six yards of skin graft after my visit. It just bothers me how FE and FI are compared against each other to measure their social gracefulness. Right. Well, it's not... The thing is, and that's partially my bad for... for projecting my third slot FE onto FE in general and creating that kind of narrative. But it's it's not social grace. It's more like um, it's trying to understand the illocutionary frame of the other person and manage it whereas fi tends to view the l just as f just as ti is limited in other words it doesn't bother looking at your illocutionary frame as far as ti is concerned ducks shit everywhere is a patently false statement not all ducks shit everywhere in fact no duck shits everywhere every single duck is limited to some extent in the scope of places that it shits you know that's a ti dealing with that thing it's just ignoring the illocutionary frame. FI also ignores the other person's illocutionary frame. It just it just interprets what the person says in relation to itself. That hurt my feelings. Why the other person said it, what the other person's trying to do, and so forth, are secondary matters, right? So, um... A good example of this is, uh, well, I mean, FI is aware about social stuff, not necessarily right away. So, uh, a long time ago, my dad asked me to sell the Ford. Then he, he said shortly thereafter, you know what, hold that, hold off on that. I'm not sure we want to sell the Ford. I said, fine. And then, um, I hear from Cameron that my dad's asked him to sell the Ford. And I said my feelings were hurt you know so i i marched right inside the house and i said uh dad didn't you say that didn't you ask me to sell the ford and tell me to wait on it for a bit and his he, his face went like oh jesus and i i totally forgot i'm so sorry i didn't i was like okay don't worry about that no problem my feelings are only hurt if he purposely did that because he thought i wasn't capable of selling the car or something or the camera would do a better job if he wanted Cameron to do a better job, wanted Cameron to do it in that situation, then he should have asked Cameron in the first place, right? Um, but regardless, since it was just he forgot, it didn't hurt my feelings at all because I don't particularly want to sell the car, right? <laughs> so uh, it just seems like kind of a hassle. But um, the point is, uh, I think my dad... My dad likes Cameron, and when there's an opportunity for Cameron to make some money and work needs to be done, he likes to, to give it to Cameron or whatever, and that's fine. I, I get that. Uh, so, so what's to be taken away from here? My FI uh, didn't didn't care what the illocutionary frame was. However, once my TI found out what the illocutionary frame was, my FI no longer cared. I wasn't concerned about whether or not I got to sell the car. I was concerned about whether my dad was dissing me. 
Does that help explain FE and FI things? That the FI exists regardless, but can be can be relieved by by new truths. Is feeling metaphysically dumped on FI? What do you mean metaphysically dumped on? Like, is normally when somebody says dumped on, they mean like everybody's taking pot shots at you with words. Is that what you mean? Okay. Um, well, definitely negative words about a person have varying degrees of capacity to evoke negative FI from people. Um, if you're in an environment where you're subject to a lot of critique, I will quote Becky, the, uh, uh, it's funny because th this is, it's the difference between, it's the, it's why you always want to be a good guy, okay? Because I am happy to take from Becky everything good that she had to offer. The fact that she despises me and and uh, approaches me with spite for, at all times is irrelevant. Anyway, what she said is, criticism is inconsistent with love. And it's true. Loving people don't spend their time criticizing each other. They try to avoid it. It doesn't mean criticism is never, is never appropriate. It doesn't mean it's always avoidable. But... Uh, there is no way, in no way, shape, or form is a pattern of criticism an expression of love. And of course, it's also critically important to note the following. There are, when, when criticism is necessary, there is an acceptable approach to criticism and an unacceptable approach. The acceptable approach to criticism is to say, that specific behavior crossed my boundaries for the following reasons, and should be noted between the two of us, we should agree that it was wrong. You should acknowledge that and apologize for it. That's the correct way to critique a behavior. The incorrect way to critique a behavior is, see how meow you are? Because the point of a healthy relationship is when your partner doesn't behave perfectly, you, you by default afford them the benefit of the doubt that that bad behavior is an anomaly from their normally good nature, not representative of their typical bad nature, right? So, one of the things that was interesting about taking DMT the other night is when I finally got to the breakthrough point, and there will be plenty of people who say I didn't really break through or whatever, but uh, I certainly reached a level that was qualitatively way different than than the tripping I had done previously, and to some extent destroyed my my ego, as is sort of promised by psychedelics. But what happened when it destroyed my ego? I became way more egotistical because my ego is what's preventing me from from just constantly speaking the truth in harsh fashion, I guess. I don't know. When did you start learning about cognitive functions and why? Uh, I just, I was already YouTubing. I was making what I called Eric's philosophy talk videos, which were basically really boring, unwatchable things of me musing aloud so I'd have an archive of ideas that I fantasized someday I'd make into a book. Um, as I was making those videos, one day I, I ran across cognitive functions. When I first encountered MBTI, it wasn't until my early 30s. I determined then that I was an ENTP. I read some type descriptions, thought it was cool, but I, had, I read nothing about cognitive functions. I never heard anything about cognitive functions at all until about 10 years later when I was doing YouTube videos. So like my first video on cognitive functions is me going, so I'm an ENTP, and according to this cognitive function thing, it says I have uh, extrovert intuition first, and then this introvert thinking, and these are what I believe they mean by these things. And that's how I started getting into cognitive functions. That's the 
the first video I made on cognitive functions was also the first successful video I made. Um, it was quite successful. It was dramatically more successful than any other video I'd ever made before. It was 20 minutes long and it flowed pretty damn smoothly. Uh, I just went went down along the cognitive functions, read like the little description of it and say, well, that's true. Well, that's not really true for me. Like, it's like that kind of. So it's not me being an expert at all. The point is, I don't act like an expert because I, I, I'm someone who likes to act like an expert. I act like an expert because seven intensive years writing, thinking, and engaging with people at this topic have made me a genuine expert. You know? Hi, Ike Ogiamini. Ogiamian. I need to just come up with a good way to say that. Ogiamin. Ogami. Ogiamian. Ogiamian. It seems like it has an extra syllable than you want it to have, you know? Uh, you want it to be like Ogiamin. But it's Ogiamian. So interesting. I see you as harsh and abrasive often. When you raise your voice, it raises my hair on my neck. Yet I know you know and I'm used to it. I mean, I, I often am harsh or abrasive, but... Um, well, if you watch the if you watch the forty five minutes or so after, I, I think it was Artie, maybe who, who got me to finally get through with the three long hits. He said, "Just do it right now. Just do three big long," and that finally worked. If you watch the forty five minutes after that, um, I barely look at the chat. I'm I don't care at all what anybody saying in the chat I'm just going it felt as though all the shackles were off and all I could do was just explain how things are why they're that way and and I mean it started with see what happened was uh, who was it I forget his name now. This guy who comes around a lot and who's who struggles with between like hateriness and coolness, basically. Nicholas Watson. And he said, God, ENTPs are oblivious to how they look to others. And I just I just whatever, let it let it slide. After I swamped all the DMT, the first thing I said practically was Nicholas Watson, you think we're oblivious to how we appear? If I were actually oblivious to how we appear, I would be so mean to you, you'd cry for the rest of your life. So that's the kind of thing that I normally don't say, right? Um, it's not really true. I wouldn't want to be that mean to anybody. But what I was saying is, okay, the packaging comes off now and here's how it actually is now note it doesn't matter how drugged out I was and also that I'm not prone to magical thinking I don't think I learned anything from that I don't think I was saying anything new I stand behind everything I said it was as true then when I was saying it on DMT as it is now and it wasn't the DMT that revealed any of the truth to, of it to me all the DMT did was strip away my affect you know so that I didn't I didn't feel any need to be nice anymore um, didn't care I, I is that a good thing not really <laughs> but you know what I think that's what happens when ego death occurs for somebody who's not wrestling with ego as it's traditionally understood ego is traditionally understood could be just equals lying to yourself I don't have that problem. No, so it happened in another way. You just went into a black hole looking into the blind birds thing. It was birds, eggs, cracking in the 1970s that made me made us realize DDT was bad. So probably not a good sign. <laughs> so you think that the what you saw on DDT is symbolic of of the metaphorical role it will play. Uh, in humanity that it's going to cause our babies to crack inside wombs. 
Birds going blind in DC because of DMT? <laughs> if birds started doing too many DMT, too much DMT. Okay, well, right, Rain. I mean, look, telling the truth doesn't mean that one is forbidden from using hyperbole. So when I say to, to Rachel, I'm starving. If we don't get to fast food in five minutes, I'm going to die of starvation. I'm obviously not meaning that literally. It's hyperbolic to express an honest sentiment, which is I'm very hungry and need to eat fast or I'm going to get hangry, right? Same thing with Nicholas Watson, right? Obviously, when I'm saying I'd be so mean you'd cry for the rest of your life, it's not possible to be that mean. I mean, you got to sleep sometimes. You can't cry while you're sleeping all night. So, yeah, obviously rain. Um, hyperbole doesn't validate as literally true under TI metrics. That's true. But, I mean, this is what I'm saying. This is the limited nature of TI. It's like TI is also the, the, the function that says, Nah, ducks don't, sh ducks don't shit everywhere. This duck has shit multiple places, but not everywhere. It's like, okay, fucktard. <laughs> I don't literally mean duck shit everywhere. I mean, if you get ducks, you're going to have a lot of duck shit to clean up. Well, then why did you just say that? Because I'm colorful in my expressiveness. Mr. Drab Black and White World. <clears throat> yeah, it really does taste awful. It's funny, you can kind of taste it the next day in your mouth. Uh huh? Yeah. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it is weird. I was wondering if you were too. <laughs> now, see, why Joe has raised whether she meant to or not a very interesting question. Uh -huh. Namely, she said birds are going blind in Washington, D.C. Let's say it turns out. <laughs> that DMT causes bird blindness. Oh People God. smoking DMT causes bird blindness. Now this presents a very challenging moral conundrum because what's usually argued in this kind of context is something like, like drugs, right? By buying cocaine, you're contributing to all the murder that goes along with cocaine. That's complete bullshit because those people themselves are responsible for their own actions just as you're responsible for your own actions, right? However, if it were to turn out that my casual drug use um, was responsible for birds going blind, then I would feel in that instance I were morally culpable to not do DMT. So the reason being this, in the first instance there are only, there are, that all the parties involved are themselves moral agents. In the second instance, half the parties that are involved are not moral agents, they're custodial responsibilities. So, uh, that's a very interesting scenario you pose there. Of course, if one were to extrapolate from that to a logical conclusion, then one would say that nobody should be able to drive, blah, 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 blah. But because the link between those behaviors and human harms is less direct and specific, it's, um, it's a much harder moral question to address, much less clear cut. Isn't that interesting? How, like, with DDT, the, the bug killer, with DDT the bug killer, we were using it to kill bugs and it had the unintended consequence of killing birds. So people stopped using it. Now, the thing about that is the populations we were talking about in that instance included agriculture interests versus wildlife interests. Agriculture and wildlife are always in conflict with each other, right? There's no there's no non-conflictatory relationship between agricultural and wild space. To generate agricultural space is to reduce wild space to agricultural space. Now, in the third instance, where individuals smoking DMT, the DMT smoke gets into the air and somehow causes birds to go blind, um, you have a really distinct instance from DDT, 
you also have a really distinct instance from driving a car. Well, driving a car produces air pollution and that harms wildlife in general. Well, okay, it harms wildlife in general, but that's, um, that's not an adequately robust link to a specific harm because the solution is to, there, there's, no, there's no solution that's not more encompassing than any specific problem within the splay of problems produced. Uh, if you ever start taking things too seriously, just remember that we are talking monkeys on an organic spaceship flying through the universe. Um, I'm not a talking monkey. And, you know, I may be on Earth. That doesn't mean I'm flying anywhere. And I'm more important than that. I'm certainly more important than Joe Rogan. <laughs> if Joe Rogan wants to celebrate his insignificance, fine. I'm not insignificant. Hey, people, I didn't say I was smarter than him or richer than him. By his own admission, I'm more significant than him. <coughs> After all, <coughs> he advises others to embrace their own insignificance as a means of lightening up. I mean, that's all well and good if you're a Japanese anime character who's um, on his 36,000th sword stroke of practice trying to become a master or whatever, then yeah, okay. Uh, he needs to chill out. Why is the stream so popular? Congratulations, but this kind of sucks. Why? It's not like your words aren't getting read. Everything you put gets read, right? Some magical factors must have aligned. Well, the, the reason this this live stream is more well attended than some of my others is because it has an explicitly cognitive function topic, and the talk the topic is narrow enough that everybody can relate themselves to it. Like, well, I'm either an FI or an FE person, you know. Um, in general, the advantage of this this live stream is that. It does tend to be heavily engaging with the chat. I answer people's questions, address things people say. So it, it's long been my hope that that would, in and of itself, um, <coughs> be a virtue that would be rewarded by popularity. <coughs> it's also the case... It's also the case that I'm saying a lot more interesting and intelligent things than just about anybody else. But I've long since accepted that that's not a good way to get popular. So being saying, being more correct, saying more intelligent and interesting things does not garner you much attention. A lot of the, a lot of people find it uh, unapproachable, like daunting to deal with the verbosity daunting to deal with the heavy ti without any visual any visual elements to help explain things daunting because i'm just so comfortably not making accommodations oh sorry everybody this is an expert level trek if you're not expert level and you're struggling uh i'm not gonna notice so uh you know probably head back downhill on your own there are no rescue teams around here either and uh, I don't have any extra rations. I'm not so much a guide leader as I am some guy walking up the mountain and people are around or not, you know? Well, Rain, then, you should be glad to have an even more robust environment in which to test the veracity of that claim. 
If it is in fact true, Rain, that I only read your messages because of your immaculate NI message sending timing in my beautiful smooth blue profile pic. Well, we'll see if that's enough to carry you forward as a red one, as they're known. One who is red uh, with more competition, you know. It's easy to be a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. Can you be a medium fish in a big pond is a harder question. True that. There's a short bus waiting for me at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Thank God. I'm so tired of being on a long bus. <laughs> I am ready to just go full blast retard. It's, it's so much, this is so much more challenging, right? Than just being dumb. Yeah? I mean, it's it really got to be more challenging. It has to be. It definitely is. They say, If I'm going to get somebody to like this video, I'm going to need to give them a little bit of song and dance, not just some words, like this. Waka, 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 waka. Hey there. Welcome. Like my channel. Like my video. Yeah. I have to do a little bit more of that stuff, you know. Oh my gosh. Joey, did you just push thumbs up? Thank you so much. Have I mentioned you're my favorite viewer? I love all of you guys so much. <laughs> and I really want to be successful, right? <laughs> I just see that all stream long. People would eat it up, I'm sure, you know? <laughs> I was thinking about it today how a lot of ESFPs on YouTube are very popular right well i mean and here's here's esfp and, and they do similar things similar kinds of activities to infjs you'll get plenty of esfp tarot people um yes they're not they make me sad so it's like um uh, let me get a tarot card to demonstrate esfp tarot reader this is my imitation of ESP tar tarot reader. ESP tarot reader. Okay, hi. So you chose stack one. Let's take a look at what we got. Okay, this card. So this is the three of pentacles. And this card tells us that in your life right now, there's someone who's who's really kind of important, who's always asking and checking and making sure that things are fine for you, and that they're sometimes putting too much pressure on you. You've got to just learn to say no and just know the universe will provide. I'm not going to be pushed around by your words or your thoughts, okay? So that's the first thing to remember. Now let's see our second card in your e in your ESFP Tarot Reader reading, the Page of Pentacles. Ooh, look, we've got another pentacle in here. So the page really represents the childlike, authentic part of yourself. And again, you're going to feel really kind of constrained, kind of limited, kind of closed in by people with all their, they're always telling you things and, and, you know, pretending like you got to think this way or that way. Everything's all black and white. Don't be pinned in by that. That's what that card's telling us. That be your child self. When it comes to pentacles, well, those matters are matters like pine hats and stuff. But the point is, don't get so serious that you forget what's really important. Okay, now the third card in your stack. Let's see. Okay, what's it gonna be? Oh, it's the hanged man. Hanged man. This is a really common problem card for a lot of people. The thing is, a lot of times we're stuck trying to wonder who it is that someone is that, that you, you should do or what it is you should do, or whether like, should I bang that guy or not? And it's just like, ah, oh, just go for it. It's time to just let go of your hesitations. Remember, what you want, what you wish, what you will, that's what you'll experience in life. How you feel, that's what it'll tell you, whether what you're doing is the right path or not. Regardless, it's time to take action. Okay, what? <laughs> what? Was that a tarot reading? What? That's an ESFP tarot reading. In a nutshell. It's very positive. But, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Look, the problem is ways that you're not like me, okay? <laughs> So right now you're probably experiencing too much hesitation. You're you're looking too much before you leap. 
That'll be twenty-five dollars. <laughs> ESFP tarot reader. <laughs> would you guys like? For those of you who haven't heard it, would you like to hear my imitation of Chinese woman answering the phone? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ring, ring. Ni hao. Dui, dui, dui a, dui. Mmm, 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 mmm. Dui, dui a. Bye, bye. That's a Chinese woman receiving a phone call. Middle-aged Chinese woman receiving a phone call. Okay. So that's what that imitation is called. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what other imitations can you do, Eric? Uh, well. You do a good New Yorker. Oops, Rebecca Bitsum, are you an ESFP? This is the problem with truth, right? It's always stepping on someone's toes. ESFP tarot readers. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. It's just obviously they're way more popular than me. Remember, you could just you could just account this to sour grapes. They're way more popular than me because they're always saying a bunch of positive shit, right? Like, you're the best. You're great. You're gonna do it. You know what? This is a minor I'm obstacle. Told you to, like, leave your partner, though. It's like the weirdest thing. Your partner is the problem. It's not you, okay? Your partner's a minor obstacle in this grand scheme of life. You just need to take action and go get out of that right now. And you'll find your true happy self because then you'll be free to do whatever all the time. Eric, you need to go on a Valium trip? A Valium trip or a Valium trip? Let us see some other parts of my fluently transracial. My, I'm fluidly transracial. Okay, I'm fluidly. I, that does mean I'm fluent in my racial identity. It doesn't mean I'm fluent in all of those languages. Okay. So, for example, I'll I'll become um, French Canadian now. Hey hey hey, Link! We got the maple syrup. I'm gonna kill some beavers and take their fur off of them. Wear them as a hat, a chapeau. We. Oui. That's my imitation of a French Canadian. Yeah. I just have to. Because everybody knows French Canadians are all about two things. Maple syrup and beaver skin. And I'm not talking any sexual innuendo here. They just despise those beavers. You tell everyone to find their darkest fears and wallow in them until they are processed. Maybe that's where you went wrong. <laughs> Ah. Okay, I'm your life coach today. Life coach channel called Eric's Life Coaching Service. Uh, first tip, remember, you're probably mediocre and will always be that way. Sorry is just how it is. Life tip number two. If it makes you sad, then you should probably wonder if you've set your aspirations too high. Mm -hmm. Or if you've internalized some metric that's not really your own. Three. This episode is specifically for people with drugs and alcohol problems. Let's say you've got a drug or alcohol problem. You just can't stop smoking so much marijuana or something. Well, you've got two choices. Decide you don't have a problem or quit. But, 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 yeah. That's it. Those are your only two choices. Sorry. Next caller. <laughs> I've got a mouthful of guinea pigs. Spit them out. Next caller. See, that's radio close. There. I got a bad haircut. Wear a hat. Next caller. <laughs> God. Like nobody can solve their own problems anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you think people would watch that YouTube channel? <laughs> Where people come to me with their problems and I just shit on them? You got that problem? Oh my god. What kind of idiot are you? Alright, alright. Just let me finish laughing at you then I'll try to solve it. Okay, let's see. Heroin addict, heroin addict. Um, uh, develop an allergy to needles. Next caller. <laughs> but, 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 but. I already answered your question. One question. Yeah, I'm, 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 
I, 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 I'm not a uh, 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 next crawler. <laughs> Uh, in case you didn't get where that guy was going, he's not assertive enough. <laughs> Solution, experience the natural consequences of your own pussyfooting. <laughs> I'm ugly and want a spouse. Well, I'm sure you can find someone to marry you. It depends how picky you are about your spouse. And what other qualities you have besides physical appearance. Not all dudes are super shallow. Do you have any other uses besides being... <laughs> being ugly? Do you have any I mean, are you good at anything? <laughs> are you an excellent person for doing yard chores or something? What's your both aptitude and aptitude for fellatio? These are important questions. Rebecca, I watch Dr. Ann, Dr. Grande sometimes. If you found Megan Lavota's channel, she is the only other female ENFJ I know online, I think. Dr. Grande is so poorly named. Do you know that guy's like five foot one? Grande, my ass. Wait, this is your large? All right, give me a venti. Megan Lavota is an ENFJ for yes, sure. I, I typed her. I I personally typed her. Yeah, you can look at the typing session itself and you'll just see exactly what I would predict for an ENFJ. Watch her deal with the TI questions. That is textbook fourth slot TI. Well, Joey, but let's not get into this. You know, you, there are different ways to approach this thing. For example, you could have approached it by saying, meow, meow, meow quality of Megan Lavota. Uh, surprises me if she's really an ENFJ. Would, how would you account for that, Eric? Or something like that would be an excellent way of actually getting discussed. But you don't want to learn anything. You want to declare yourself more the most knowledgeable. The nice thing about TI tool function is what TI is being a subject in its most natural form is it's a getter of information. It's what asks questions. The strongest TI user asks, especially with extroverted intuition, like INTPs will always ask the best, best questions in cross-examination. They know what to ask. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the N and the F and ENFJ stand for Megan Lavoda. <laughs> Megan spells her, way, her name in an odd way. <laughs> she has a, a, a silent N before the M <laughs> and a silent F before the L. So... <laughs> You're good at reframing the questions TI users ask to be the questions you're willing to answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure you are. Uh, that's a good way to get me mad at you if you ever do it to me because uh, I hate it when people think they can get away with that shit, you know? When people try to answer questions other than the ones I ask, oh my God, it's both insult and injury concurrently first of all it's injury because you didn't answer the question i asked second of all it's insult because you thought you could get away with that shit with me the fuck you can you know <laughs> i'm not i'm not talking to you specifically here why joe but there's a lot of people who have that some variant on that technique of trying to avoid Questions and if you're not T I N E, you may well be be uh, caught by it. In fact, if you're not an experienced T I N E person, any T I person with argumentation, you might be caught by it. Um, I remember there's this trick this ESTP kept doing it to me during class. It took me a long time to both catch on to it and stop 
and stop being reflexively slave to it, which is I had this ESP kid when I was talking about lecturing about a given block of argumentation or something, he'd get up and ask a relevant question that nevertheless forced me to go off track onto a different topic or subtopic or whatever. And he'd do it again and again just because he got kicks out of kicking the anthill and watching me move as anticipated. Um, eventually I caught on to it and I, I successfully built defenses against it. But um, man, I was very, very susceptible to that, you know? One thing I was, I've never been susceptible to is people answering questions other than the one I ask. Not for a long time anyway. Eric, if you have time, can you give me serious advice on picking up a girlfriend? I'm lonely in my life and this topic could be useful to me. Okay, well. In life, there are a lot of different instances where there's a conjoining. So, for example, for people who apply to college, they're applying to be conjoined with this college or university. For people who uh, do a deal, I'm gonna buy the car and pay you $500 a month, they're conjoined by this contract. Um, for people who uh, buy a house, they're conjoined by the escrow to the people who are selling it. The thing is, in many or all of those circumstances, you can perceive things as one party is the chooser and one party is the choosee. But in relationships, it doesn't work like that. It shouldn't work like that. And the reason some men have trouble with dating and picking up chicks and stuff is because they assume it does work like that. Don't listen to Niebuhr. Step one, do not listen to Niebuhr. That is incorrect advice. Totally fucking wrong. Do not get through the loneliness. Do not endure it. Do not become its friend. Do not reconcile yourself to it. Um, you, you acknowledge it as what it is. A symptom of a serious problem that you don't have enough engagement in your life I was lonely for a long time while I was married with a kid and had no idea I, even I was lonely I was lonely until talking to fans people then I ceased being lonely then I finally had enough engagement okay thing is it's very possible to say hey you know what in every in every life some some dark days will come um, just because I'm alone and lonely right now doesn't mean it's the end of the world, or whatever. That's fine. Those are all good things to say. But um, the bottom line is don't don't welcome loneliness into your home like I did. You know? Don't assume it's always gonna be there hanging around. If you're my kind of person and you experience loneliness as I do, the solution is start a YouTube channel. And reconcile yourself to the fact that you're going to be talking to yourself for a long time. It takes a while to build. I mean, you, you'll be faster than me. That's very, you can always have that silver lining. If you want to start a YouTube channel and you want to have a silver lining, um, I'll get to your question in a second, Abraham. Um, so that's what I mean by you, you say fight through the loneliness I, I'm not opposed to that I'm just saying uh, but rather than fight through it which treats it like a, a water you move through I would say try to dry off as quickly as possible you know um, seek more companionship open yourself up to more possibilities in terms of engagement. As far as looking for a chick, um, I, 
I would say be patient about that as much as possible and focus on the first thing first. So if you aren't at all lonely, despite not having a girlfriend and you are, you've got lots of interesting things pulling at you from different directions, then you can decide to get a girlfriend, right? Your, your status and stock go up to the extent that you're the one making the decision. If you're just sort of waiting for a girlfriend to happen or wishing a girlfriend would or looking to say, well, what kind of action should I take to make one happen? You're already in the, you're already in the wrong lane. So if instead you're in a place where you've decided now you're, you want to include a second person because both you're ready in who you are and because it will add to an existingly, you know, don't need a girlfriend to be part of a complete breakfast, have a complete breakfast and note that, you know what? A line of cocaine would go good with this complete breakfast. And that's what your girlfriend is. Your morning line of cocaine. Mm. That's so how do you get, how do you get yourself unlonely? Once that question's answered, you won't even have to worry about the question of, of how do you get a girlfriend? Because unlonely means you're exposing yourself to lots of different people, not in this, not in the showing them your junk way. Okay. <laughs> not like that kind of exposing yourself. Uh, the great thing about the modern world is you don't even have to leave your house. You can start a YouTube channel and you start your first video. I want to make some more friends or I want people to come talk to me about me. Whatever, right? And you can sit there all by yourself, waiting and waiting and waiting. Let's say you have a video conference room you've invited people to. And while you're waiting, you can talk or play on the guitar or periodically remind people why you're waiting or do something else and live stream and then prepare yourself to have a brief conversation with somebody. Uh, maybe it'd be awkward or whatever. You got to prepare yourself to endure the, the early parts of the thing, which do not reward occasional attempts, occasional half hearted attempts. You got to be persistent in, in sitting, sitting still without expectations. So like, here's what I want, not what I expect. I'm going to just leave that open and do other things and maybe somebody will show up. You do that often enough, especially if you have a topic that you like to talk about and or and switch up variants of that. I would like to interview somebody knowledgeable about Mia. Shit like that. Eventually, you'll find you've got lots of people you talk to and then eventually you'll be like, uh, no, I don't remember you at all, but thank you for saying that our engagement impacted you a lot some, some time when we talked, which is what happens to me. You know, it's not because I don't remember them because I don't respect them or something. It's just, I have a shitty memory and I can only keep a certain number of people in it. It has to be a fairly high impact on me memory for me to remember it, you know? Um, Rain, the only extent to which defense lawyers can BS a claim, quote unquote, is to present an alternate theory of the crime. Um, even the alternate theory of the crime, what they're, what they're saying is, here's the prosecution's explanation. And we're, we're showing there's just as much evidence for this alternate theory. That the evidence existent, the real evidence that we're all referencing, as well supports this interpretation as that. There's nothing wrong with that kind of argument. It doesn't undermine justice in any way. If in fact it's true, then they failed to prove beyond a reasonable uh, doubt that their theory of the crime is correct. The prosecution has, you know, and the person should be let go. I mean, the thing is, the thing that the defense does mostly, if they're guilty, is exercise their Fifth Amendment right to not testify. Um, it's only not guilty people 
who want to tell their story a lot. The guilty people are largely relying on saying nothing and hoping that the difficulty of establishing something behind a reasonable doubt is sufficient to find them not guilty of the crime. Rebecca, you want to put a link? I'll make you a moderator briefly, okay? Chibo says, Hey, Eric, ENTJ18 here. I'm the brash and brutally honest, inconsiderate guy in high school home and also see myself as having very flexible morals and questionable ethics about almost everything. I have a by any means necessary attitude. Do I have both low FE and low FI? Is this expected and how the hell is this even would it even work on this? Okay, so there's three things at factor here, Shibo. This is a great question. I appreciate you asking it. And I have a perfect answer for you. Number one, you're a TE Dom, which means you view everything in life through a utilitarian frame, including other people. Other people are resources that you can use in various ways. Uh, number two, you have very flexible and questionable ethics because being a TE Dom necessarily means you ignore TI. TI wants consistency and wants explanations that withstand scrutiny and other sort of principled negative prohibitions, okay? But you ignore that. The third factor, fourth slot FI. There are things that are precious to you and that matter to you and you know you live better version of yourself when you include more of that kind of calculation in your overall self, but it's a pain in the ass and you avoid it and you only do it sometimes. Here's the fourth factor that is what I thought was gonna be the third factor, but it was actually the fourth factor that is the most important factor. Your brain's not done growing. Um, the kind of uh, the, the capacity to honestly self-assess what matters to you since it's low in the stack and or how important your body and your bodily health are since that's polar, your capacity to understand those two things is very low right now until you're at least like 23 or 24. So when I was 18, I used to think, as a college freshman, I'd say to myself things like, well, you know, if my parents were to both die, it would kind of be a good thing. I certainly wouldn't be sad about it or anything. Why would one be sad about such a thing? And uh, I'd inherit their resources and I'd be able to utilize them as I wish. And I thought that made perfectly good sense. Not that I was going to try to kill them or anything, but um, rather just that, you know, everybody seems to be making a big deal about this death thing. At the end of my freshman year in college, I went to my grandmother's funeral. She had died like during finals week or something. And, uh, I recall feeling nothing. I'm not sad. Why would I be sad? This old woman was increasingly difficult uh, burden on me and the rest of the family for the last couple of years. Why would I be sad that she's dead now? That's how I thought then. And that's what one would call schizoid. But it's not really a condition or disorder or whatever. You could also call it T above F male between 16 and 23. It's true probably for every T above F male between 16 and 23, except possibly INTJ and ISTJ with their third slot FI. That's why it's, it's, it's the war age, right? Who do you want to send into war? 18 to 23 year olds. Why? They aren't capable of understanding the significance of death. Powerful. So you have to trust, however, your logic. That is to say, Eric is speaking the truth here and recognize that you need to preserve your moral agency for when you can understand it. Don't go out and do a bunch of wicked shit now before you can understand that it's wicked and why.
Well, RDL, that's factually incorrect except for bench trials. Guilt or innocence is determined by the jury. And to determine somebody guilty of a criminal offense, one needs a unanimous decision of jurors. Uh, otherwise, you have a hung jur jury in a mistrial or uh, a unanimous decision to acquit, in which case the person is acquitted. I had a Discord community for a while, and the problem with Discord is as it, as it links to me, um, there's no benefit to it. In other words, the audience there is, it, it doesn't work like YouTube, it doesn't work within my existing platform. Number two, the people who gather there are primarily interested in tearing me down. We've tried this before in a couple of different contexts and it's turned out that way. It ends up creating a group of spiteful, rancorous people who uh, who are wrong, but who can't stand the fact that I'm not humble enough in my affect or that I'm, I'm, they're just consumed by the notion that I need to be taken down a notch, right? The thing is, if they were to deal with me as an actual human being, what they'd see is I'm constantly being taken down notches all over the place. It's okay. I understand life's a process of notch movement. I go down, I go up, I go down, I go up. I don't know. Sometimes I'm I'm the humiliated one in a given context. Sometimes somebody else is. That's just F.E., you know? No, I mean, I tried to argue one-on-one -on -one with people from Discord, and I encountered what you can only call dissembling, a refusal to allow language to meaningfully do anything. So if, if you want to have a discussion with me about ideas or an argument or a debate, understand what that process is going to be. It's going to be a process of you and I agreeing and disagreeing on the statuses of things and then leaving those matters behind and moving forward. I don't want to have any circular arguments between with people who are stupid. I don't want to have any arguments with vaganites, people who simply try to vague out their definitions of everything so nothing can be operationalized. That's missing the fucking point. I don't want to argue with any um, uh, nib people assigning a constant stream of necessary but insufficient burdens. Yeah, but before you can be right, you need to first prove that you exist. Before that, you need to prove that even existence exists. Before you need that, you need to prove that words mean things. I don't want to argue with those idiots. Those arguments have already been accounted for and dealt with across the history of argumentation. There's nothing left to say about them. This is interesting. They're just stupid, fucking shitty arguments. So, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like dealing with... I just... Look, I'm not saying... I'm not trying to judge the ghetto for being slummy. I just prefer going elsewhere... You know, uh, it, people who love the ghetto and love the slums should be happy living there and get no judgment from me. But personally, when I'm going to go out to get a carton of milk, I'm not going to go to the store in the slummiest part of town. Because I know that even though I may get back home just fine, I will have been panhandled at five times. I will have been propositioned by prostitutes. I will have had an attempted mugging. I would have been treated rudely at the store and I would have gotten the stink of, of stupidity all over me and I have to wash my clothes when I get home. <sighs> Ghetto milk does have a lot of character. It's infused with the misfortune of the poor. <laughs> That's that <laughs> slightly spoiled taste. What's the rationale behind the right to remain silent? It's not really a right to remain silent. It's a uh, it's autonomy over expression, which includes the full scope of expression, be it words spoken as expression or the choice to not express. Now, it doesn't include calls to action. So there's a limit to what words can be considered expressive, but certainly silence is a form of is a choice along the spectrum of expression. 
In fact, silence is a necessary component of any correct or good or successful expression. That pause allows you to let that sink in. How critical silence as part of one's autonomous choice range in the toolbox of expression, it actually is. Well, when FE people try to spot FI people, they try to spot FI, they can be catastrophically wrong. I was surprised, not shocked, not appalled or anything, but surprised that Legends Fall was one of the ones in the chat yesterday who was saying, I see an FI dom. I mean, <laughs> that he, he, he said, like, C.S. Joseph calling himself an ENTP is a good sign that he's ni polar, right? Um, Legends Fall calling that guy an FI Dom is a good indication that he's ni fourth and FI polar. Because how you would conclude that guy was an FI Dom is beyond me. It, it just there's no indication of it whatsoever. He's this ESTJ uh, who's lost in a swamp of wrongness uh, having com committed double, triple, and quadruple down on the patently false assertion that he's an ENTP just one of those he's, uh, he's an erstwhile boxer because he won't accept my my challenge I've thrown down the proverbial gauntlet I have taken off my proverbial glove and metaphorically slapped him across his proverbial face. But I have as yet to receive any reply. You know, I do have a, a warning that never goes away on my channel. And I received that warning because Big Scary Eric bullied C.S. Joseph. I bullied him, apparently. The guy's got five or six times the subscribers I have at the time, probably still, probably maybe even a higher ratio now. And I got a bullying strike. It was after he had indicated that everything Taylor says should be dismissed because Taylor's uh, a drug user and an ex-con. I made a video explaining how that kind of ontological assault is genuinely deserving of outrage. It's it's the equivalent of somebody being straight up old school racist and saying just things that nobody ever says anymore, right? It there will come a day when such comments as that are treated as appalling and reprehensible. But today is not that day, and my response was deemed more reprehensible than um, than his dismissal of Taylor because my response was much less civil and that was the day that I determined it was time for me to grow up and use civil discourse and not yell profanity to people and not do name calling and stuff like that because it's childish and stupid and on those grounds I deserved some sort of punishment however I don't like the fact that it's permanent there should be a statute of limitations on these things it used to be maybe the statute of limitations was too short, but uh, come on, have it fall off my record after five years or something, please, shall we? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I'm not, I am not trying to say that it's not possible for me to bully him. Um, although I was kind of implying it, right? I'm just saying... The only thing that was taken into consideration when giving me that bullying strike was the content of the video I made. There was no context taken into consideration at all. That's for sure. And even if there had been, maybe I was still guilty of bullying. I was guilty of incivility, that's for sure. And uh, fine. But the point I'm making is, uh, is that... is that I often say things without having a point. 
<laughs> the world's worst stenographer. <laughs> you, you do, you do, Rue. <sighs> Lijo is not pretending to be an INTJ, and Lijo is not an ESFP. Let me make this abundantly clear. In no sane universe does anyone who knows anything about typology actually think Lijo is an ESFP. But Eric, in your type police video, you said that. Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of like the bullying case, right? I was basing it off one video. It was a type police episode. I wasn't actually typing her. And I thought it was better for views at the time to throw people in jail. Regardless, I, I threw her in jail. I threw, I threw Frank James in jail. Frank James is definitely an INFJ. Why Joe is definitely, indisputably, regardless of anything else, you want to say is indisputably either an ENTJ or an INTJ. You cannot even begin to argue anything to the contrary. If you want to say there's more evidence of her being an ENTJ than an INTJ, I will agree with you that there is more visible evidence of that. However, I would point out that 99% of her life isn't visible to us. So the idea that he, she's an ESFP though is absolutely nuts. She's way way, way too TE intuitive for that. It's just, uh-uh. No, no chance. Zero chance. NI is not fourth. And TE is not third. And yes, I've seen the video of her uh, you know, what do they call it? Like, you know, extra or something? Like, um, I live extra and then she's like doing these weird dances on rocks and shit. I'm like, oh my God, talk about Effie Polar. <laughs> That's what I conclude from that. It's like, Jesus Christ, woman, this mishmash of horrible aesthetics cannot possibly have come for anybody to Effie Polar. And this incredibly beautiful production value cannot possibly make you anything but INTJ. Nobody but an INTJ does bad aesthetics that well. That's just how it is. They're incredibly great at everything but being cool. <laughs> and being cool, they kind of suck ass, you know? Like, I'm way cooler than Lijo, but she's a lot more successful than me. But look, Lijo doesn't have anything in her entire wardrobe remotely as stylish as this hat. Let's just all admit it. The outfit I'm currently wearing with this peachy shirt and this hat Lijo could dig through her wardrobe for a million years and would not even approach one half this amount of stylishness. Can we all admit that? Can we all admit that that's that the kind of crazy nonsense that you see in that video about her being extra or whatever, those, those mishmash of different colors and styles and stuff aesthetically is a disaster but the production values of the drones and the music and the soundtrack and the words and it's like as pro as it could possibly be that's not ESFP you go but yeah but look at the thing she's doing she's dancing around that makes her an ESFP she's using dancing around as an NI object in this media object for a purpose you want to see an ESFP watch my video of um uh what's that song called um that song that goes everybody's panicked about the kids what's that song called i don't remember what it's called but that song the girl dancing in that video that's an esfp <laughs> she's an esfp i said to her or she i don't know if she, i asked her she asked me i think she told me she was really into dancing i said would you be willing to dance in one of my music videos? And she said yes. And I was almost done with this song that I was recording with Spacey. And uh, and I sent it to her and she danced in it. Now note, she, she required me, eventually requested, and I was happy to comply, that I take down the typing session that I did that included her. Because she didn't want that up there. But she never, she loved having this up there. She never said, take this down. Um, she was perfectly happy with how this went and if you watch it 
you can see that you can, you can see how oh, I'll put it on here okay <laughs> I don't know you can see whatever you want to see she's great right she's delightful yeah. I'm not trying to diss her at all this girl she's fantastic but um, oh. um it's just uh, what can I say um, she's the meaning is translated so directly into it's translated so directly into dance moves it's like uh, everything is her, her idea of dancing to it is to to dance out in sort of like like they do in kids uh, in kids performances of Christmas like when they sh sing ring the bell they have the kids move their hands like they're ringing a bell kind of thing it's that kind of thing and it's um it's very very great fun to watch and also rather strange you know <laughs> um so anyway it's here we go me of my roommate and that's why i'm laughing Let me make sure the audio is set properly here all right this this is what it looks like when a no Eric no 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 when an ESFP is dancing okay, here we go got a story about 10 years old it's a song for an open road and such a thing must all Always do its job. She married up Jeff, turned 19, four years in and three kids weaned. We're now in questioning the path. Agency out, pace is discretion. Locking in our courses, way too young. The urgency conferred is really just depression. Making sure those underneath them always run. Doug at 20 found bourbon fun, likewise Doug at 21, and so forth well up into middle age. What he once thought would set him free became his whole identity, now Doug's about another drunken rage. Agency out, pace is discretion, locking in our courses, way too young. The urgency conferred is really just depression Making sure those underneath them always run Everybody's panicked about the kids Lock them up with extra dexedrine And mathematics to promote success Or to impose more unjust duress Agency out Pace is discretion, locking in our courses, way too young. The urgency conferred is really just depression, making sure those underneath them always run. Without consent, it's really just depression, by parasites surviving while they feed their fear of dying, yes they feed a Upon the futures, feed upon the futures of the young. That's an ESFP. Okay, so what you're doing, Shibo, you're saying um, that you acknowledge her affect, the only part you can actually see, is that of an NTJ. So what's your reasoning then for concluding ESFP 
projecting that affect so successfully instead of actual ESFP, instead of actual ENTJ or INTJ. Because um, it may be possible to fake a given personality, but you can't fake their functions when they're tested as skills. You can't fake their frame of reference uh, and nor can you fake their level of intuitiveness or their robustness with TI or, you know, you can't, there's lots of things you can't fake and some of those things you can fake in display and some of those things you can't, right? So you're acknowledging on the limited amount of display you can critique, you see an ESFP faking being an NTJ. So what gives away the fact that it's a fake? I mean, cause like Marty, Marty was faking being an INFJ. No doubt about it, ESFP faking being an INFJ, doing his very best to fake it. But it was very obvious he wasn't one. Why? Because being an ESFP means you can fake sensors maybe, you're never gonna fake me out. I see right through ESFPs right away. They don't fake me out at all. Uh, if they were gonna fake me out, they would have to do so by pretending to be perhaps ENFJ. They might be able to fake me out with that because at least the, the TI is in a similarly unvalued spot in terms of utility, I guess. instance mom so the definition you have of knowledge being justified belief in real-time context is just belief itself the implications of this are groundbreaking um you don't need to be snotty uh we don't need to define knowledge as justified belief whether it is or not the point is um because we're we're not at the question of what knowledge is we're at the question of what what comprises justification. And yet, Uro, you've not prov provided any justifications for your conclusion. You provided excuses for why your conclusion, conclusion conflicts with the data. That the data does show NTJ, but she's faking it. Well, I'm not playing sarcastic games, yet, Uro, yet Uru, right? I'm not playing any sarcastic games. I'm asking you real questions. Right, so Marty might have faked out some people as being something other than ESFP, but he was totally unsuccessful at faking being an INFJ. Nothing about what he was doing would be as an INFJ did it. Uh, he, the thing about ESFPs is probably the best fakers are the most intuitive, the most metaphysical because they're the least tied to what they actually are, right? So probably the best fakers are gonna be ENTPs, INFJs, should they put their mind to it. Um, other fakers, I, like FI actors, they have to put themselves in the role, right? Like, I have to live like a, a handicapped person so I can really act like one. Otherwise, I won't be able to act like one. I have to experience it and feel it for real to act like it. That's like, you know, you're, Daniel Day Lewis's, your Joaquin Phoenix's, I guess that's called method acting. Um, examples where we use our TI in everyday life. Well, for a TI user like myself, I use it all the time. So, for example, I frequently throughout the day will correct myself on minor mistakes when I'm speaking. Like, it was Tuesday. No, actually, it was Wednesday. Um, is it necessary to correct myself that much? Uh, why am I constantly on the lookout out for tiny minor inconsistencies? Uh, because I'm TI tool and that's just how I go about doing things in life, you know? Um, so, uh, TI is not great at spotting lies, okay? It's really great at spotting inconsistencies. If the lie, if the liar has lied in a way 
that is not consistent with other things, then T.I. is great at spotting lies. But if the liar has told a lie that is not subject to T.I. deductive revelation, then it's going to be N.I.F.E. that can spot the lie anyway without being able to tell you why. So who are the best poker players? INFJs, because poker is mostly are about reading the person, not the cards. And Doyle Brunson, one of the best poker players of all time, once was quoted as saying, I could play poker and win without ever looking at my cards. My own cards. <laughs> Which is probably true. He just reads everybody at the table, sees how strong they are, and decides whether to better fold accordingly. I mean, it is true that ESFP, um, if they were going to successfully fake a type, would probably be better able to fake ENTJ than any other type. That's still not evidence as to why this example of what's apparently an NTJ is actually an ESFP faking it. So showing that it's possible for an ESFJ to fake it and showing that ESFPs do sometimes fake things is not a good reason to believe Lijo is a fake ESFP, I mean a fake INTJ. Oh, you interviewed Alec Torelli yesterday? Is he a poker player? I've never heard the name, but... Oh, so now you're saying she's an ENTJ faking INTJ. Well, again, then what you're doing is is looking exclusively at the, the grove of trees she's presenting to you and not acknowledging that there's a huge forest. The majority of the forest is not what you get to see, right? So... It's easy to conclude that every YouTuber is an extrovert. After all, they're out there making YouTube videos, but that would be silly. Well, like, it's beginning to seem to me that maybe Yeto Ruman's clusters are clusters of various kinds of turd. But I'm not convinced yet. He's not been completely irrational. Look, the thing is, Winston's mom probably shouldn't have timed him out. <laughs> I, I don't think he really deserved timing out for that, but that's fine. I'm not scolding Winston's mom. You're above reproach, good lady. Above reproach. So what's an ENTJ cluster mean? How does an ESFP without an ENTJ cluster differ from an ESFP with an ENTJ cluster? All ESFPs are the same, right? S E F I T E N I. That's it. That's an ESFP. Okay, well, if she is in fact faking being an INTJ, then that would qualify her for the status faker. So yes, in fact, if she is faking being an INTJ, then she does have the status faker necessarily. So are all ESFPs, do all ESFPs have the same ENTJ cluster? Is that, so what's my, so it's like all ENTPs have ESFJ cluster? The thing is, I I don't want to reference that right now, Sean. I I'm not interested in getting off track here. Um Hello, I'm ESFP popping in random host Eric. I watched the rest of your live last night. I agree with everything you said. I really enjoyed it. Super awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. You're great. You're fantastic. Um, but again, Yadu wrote, Yadu wrote, let's see if you are really honestly engaged in, in this conversation. What's the critical question you haven't answered that renders everything else you're saying moot? If you can't answer that question, you're just you're just wasting everyone's time and provoking because we've had you've had an opportunity now to make progress 
by answering a specific question. You've not answered it. No, Yadu, Yadu Ru. Answer the question. What is the critical question I've already asked that you need to answer to move this conversation forward? If in fact, she's actually a Mia, but looks like a Mia, what is the thing that cues you that she's not actually a Mia, right? It's not the appearance because the appearance is Mia, but you've concluded the appearance is deceptive. What is the cue you use to conclude that the appearance is deceptive, well, is misleading? What, what, what clue do you cue in on to draw that conclusion? No, you didn't. Yeah, she does. I see her ideate around here all the time. She, for example, demonstrated great ideation the other day when she put up an analogy so clever that I put it up on my own uh, community tab because I thought it was so funny. Okay, so if okay, if that my bad then. If in fact you did already answer the question twice and I I didn't notice it in the live chat, that's my bad and I stand corrected. Okay, but your claim that she doesn't ideate is factually false. I see her ideate all the time. I'm quite impressed with her intuition. I'm often struck by the intuitive insights I hear from her. Well, it was funny. That's why humor matters a lot. Just insightful is boring. Funny is good, though. <laughs> I like funny. Okay, so what you're saying is that in the videos you've watched of her, you see more visible TE than you see NI. Is that correct? Well, I mean, that would make sense. It's her tool function. The NI qualities are the frames primarily around what she's saying the te frame is dictating very much how she's doing the video and possibly the content she's talking about in other words an nite person isn't going to be talking about fe matters right except everything about her channel if you look a little bit broader than you're looking is totally te constrained by ni the channel's purposeful successful Things that she does, she does for a reason. They work towards that goal. It's working. You know, it's true that she keeps things simple in her videos. I find her, her videos oppressively uninformative. <laughs> but that's because I'm me, you know. Obviously, a lot of people like it. If if I'm if I'm dealing with cognitive functions like way over here it doesn't mean that that most people that don't need it here right i i just am i'm not there and i don't need it there so i don't want to listen to it you know but that's just it's not a problem with lijo or her videos it's just she's trying to succeed rather than indulge herself in ideation because ideation is her six slot function demonstrative if she were an entj or it's her fifth slot function ignored if she's an intj so why you'd expect so much ideation from her, I don't know. Uh, neither type likes necessarily ideating themselves as a means to an end. So uh, for the uh, ENTJ is counter <coughs> countervalued, but <coughs> they'll do it purposefully for an, towards an end, but they don't like it in general. For INTJ, they think it shouldn't be used towards an end. It's instead sort of in and of itself a value. If some, like Corey was over here the other day and he was just shitting on LCD sound system because he's learned that the guy from that band stole, stole key components of his songs from other old songs. I was like, well, who fucking cares? You know, because any is my dominant function. I understand that everything can be linked back to various things that are similar. And the directionality of grabbing doesn't really matter. Okay, so you're saying ENTJ should be outputting their NI most, right? 
So then you agree, Yetta Root, that she's an INTJ. Congratulations, we've finally gotten to the same page. We're both on the same page, she's an INTJ. Good job. You walked right down the path as I laid it out and came to the correct conclusion. Good job. I hope that puts to rest your concerns. You just, you just, you just walked yourself to the conclusion. At this point, you're no longer caring about truth at all. And then you're ignoring what I said about the larger picture. If you just want to focus on the teeniest speck of something, you can always focus on something that's a problem, right? You're, it's called cherry picking. It's called bad thinking. No, that does not, uh-uh. No, not true. Absolutely not true. Well, you say she doesn't put N-I-N at all? You're fucking crazy. Why do you think the videos are succinct the way they are? It have a series of distinct and succinct points to be made, and then she gets out. Why? Why do you think when she interviewed me, uh, or not interviewed me, but when we talked or whatever, that when she got to the end of the thing, we ended the video? Because it was time to end. Why don't we just sit around and, and chat for hours later? You know, Because she's not an ESFP who's just loving being in front of the camera and engaging. Right? The, the point is, Yeto Root, even if you still, I absolutely listen to you. You didn't listen to me. You're saying she doesn't put NI in it at all. I'm saying you're not looking at the right frame of reference. Her whole channel's NI. The fact that she's sitting there looking like a psychiatrist in what appears to be a psychiatrist's office, talking about psychiatry points in distinct, succinct points, getting the video out in a certain spe specific number of minutes and successfully garnering subs very quickly as a, as a consequence is a very N.I. reality. If you can't recognize it as such, now you're just lying to yourself or to us. So far, all points of evidence, all of this discussion has supported the notion she's an INTJ. None of it, not one thing you've said has supported the idea that she's an ESFP except for things that are factually untrue. If it were in fact the case that you could see no NI in, in Lijo, then what you would say, that would be a good point. But all of your purportedly good points are comprised of factually false statements. So, sorry, you're wrong. All the evidence, all the argumentation thus far has proven this or established this or at least suggested it. The fact that you're still pushing back without acknowledging anything tells me you're not capable or willing of thinking well. Okay, if you say I misunderstood everything you said, then fuck off. You're lying, lying, lying. I understood what you said. You shifted ground. You didn't meaningfully answer my questions. If, in fact, you had answered it twice before and I, I had not caught it, that's my bad. You haven't made a good case. Your core case was what? That she looks like an NTJ but isn't. My core point was, how can you tell the difference? You said no and I. But there's lots of NI, and I point out plenty of examples of it. Note what you're lacking. Any concrete examples, any real warrants that can be tested or, or, or operationalized at all to do anything. That's that fucking very, very textbook description of terrible thinking. And you say, I misunderstood you. What you mean is your words didn't evoke the response you wanted from me. So you must have meant something different. You meant what you said, and it was wrong. I understood it clearly, and it was wrong. You got schooled, and you don't like that. That's fine. But don't pretend as though I misunderstood you. That will never, ever happen. You may not speak words that mean things that you wish they meant. That's not me understand, misunderstanding you. Let's get that absolutely clear right now. I don't misunderstand idiots when they say idiotic things. The problem isn't my lack of understanding. It's their idiotic words. That's the problem. Okay? To be absolutely clear on this. So, you did successfully derail the conversation, I suppose. However, I'm not opposed to it in this instance because this is an issue that keeps sort of simmering into little skirmishes here and there, and I'd rather put it to bed.
The fact is, those arguing that she's an ESFP are using special pleading, general statements linking to no specific warrants, providing no real examples, and when they do provide an example or piece of evidence, it's totally cherry-picked and out of context. That's a clear sign that these people are not arguing in order to determine what's correct, but rather in order to sustain their position. And I find that deeply offensive as somebody who prefers always to be correct over being right. And that's when Eric said, Pow, 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 pow. And all of the scrubs fell down. Pow, 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 pow. And all of the scrubs fell down. Do you use TI for anything other than language? If not, to what extent does it apply to STPs? Well, I've, I've had suggested to me before by somebody, and I, it seemed like a great, a great thing to point out, that something like a circuit board is a physical manifestation of a logic that is conditional. Um, so too with something like a Rube Goldberg machine, where every, every engagement of the machine is conditionally uh, linked to some other, right? So we do have examples of physical systems that are conditional um, in the real world. And one would imagine that a TI, ISTP or ESTP would be the, uh, the best at dealing with things like circuit boards, uh, more so than a TE person. That would be an example of something we might typically think of as TE that's actually TI. That's a possibility. I haven't really thought, thought it through all that much. Um, I think the, the way that STPs typically use TI, it's, uh, it's just simply to eliminate things. So it's like, it's very difficult to pull some bullshit by an STP. And so they're constantly looking for what doesn't make sense and avoiding that and instead of using it to really determine what's correct necessarily. Uh, like what I've noticed in ESTPs especially is a tendency to determine what's correct with their NI and to determine what's incorrect with their TI. And their NI vision of what's correct is often not correct. Oh, Derek, would you consider these quote-unquote skeptics come from a school philosophy that once had a point other than to grab attention? Piro of Ellis, once they had a place in the village. Uh, I mean, I see it primarily as uh, a, status, a status reconciliation problem. So if somebody approaches this live stream convinced that they are the expert on typology and that they're going to take on the role of correcting the wrong people here and including me and one of those wrong people then they need to undergo a status correction a status a comparative status correction so whatever community they may have come from they may have been most knowledgeable about it but their knowledge should be tossed in the trash can they can start over and learn the thing properly now is the real attitude they need to bring in but it, people cling to their identity as, as you know, fastest gun in the West and on a variety of points. I've had ENFPs come try to argue with me uh, about philosophy stuff, about God. I, there was this one incredibly torturous, quote unquote, debate I had with an ENFP. Um, he was taking the anti-God side, and I was saying, yeah, I, I am a, I'm somebody who prays to God. And then he said wow so you agree that God exists I, said, I didn't say that and he by the end of him trying to trying to do his bullshit he was arguing that I have to have a good reason to believe in God I was like wait so now you're saying there is a good reason to believe in God it's like it was just such a waste of my time the per this is what happens when you don't argue against a, argue a resolution but rather a topic you need to debate an actual resolution where one side is af and one side is nag, you know? You're deciding facts that have not been proven. You have an example of NE and not NI. No, the example I gave of NI is very clear. The consistency in theme, right? Psychologist office, dressed like a psychologist. The consistency in format, the length of videos, the short amount of distinct, concise topics. Those are all good, clear indications of NI. To call that NE means you don't understand intuition at all.
That's just how it is. Okay, regardless of whether, see, this is your problem yet, Oru. We don't determine things holistically like that. We can eliminate possibilities with certain questions. So the, you did answer the question, why you think, what gives her fake away, right? And you said it was the lack of NI. I gave you concrete examples of NI. You then said they're any, but they're not. I'm not strawmanning anything. You're the one who's making the claim that we both agree she looks like an NTJ, but she's nevertheless an ESFP. I'm asking you what clues gives you, what clues are you using to determine that? And the only meaningful answer you gave was a lack of NI. Okay, her analogy, I agree, is extroverted intuition, okay? About the amount of it you'd expect from, say, an INFJ or an INTJ. It, fifth slot is quite robust. You get plenty of NI from me here too. But if you look at the larger picture, look at my channel, what don't you see? What don't you see? If you look at my channel, you don't see any NI. There's no consistency. There's no format. There's no whatever. So we need to look at different levels, right? You can't just look at what you want to look at to prove the point you want to be true, which is what you keep trying to do. Okay, so what then you tell me what it would look like, how it would look different if she were an actual INTJ. Explain it to me. Since what you what since you acknowledge that my examples of NI are in fact actual examples of NI, but that even so, they're not the kind of NI an INTJ would use because the examples I gave you are qualitative, not quantitative, then you tell me. What would it look like? What would one of her videos look like differently if it were if she were an actual INTJ? Because at this point, you are balanced on the most narrowest of margins. You've already conceded all the key points. She looks and smells like an NTJ. Her overall display is an NI frame of reference. So you conceded all the main points, but only you can see through behind all the obvious indicators of NTJ that she's actually an SFP. So what would it look like if she were an INTJ? Okay, so at this point, you're you're engaging in what I would call uh, dissembling. You're not interested in learning anything or making any progress or acknowledging anything. So that means you're not worth my time. You never established that at all, Yedoru. You never established the actual demarcations on the side of ESFP. Every time I asked you to, you kept splitting down to a narrower and narrower distinction. Acknowledging that she looks NTJ, acknowledging that the overall frame of the channel is NI, acknowledging you see plenty of TE, and yet still, some glimmer of secret reveal allows you to see that despite all the evidence, and despite the fact that none of us can see 99% of the evidence of who, who she actually is, you're able to tell that she's an ASFP. And you make the claim that the actual demarcation is determined already, despite having established it with no good points or evidence. Then at that point, you're not, you're subhuman, you know? No, ESFPs use SE and FI the most because that's their function stack. ESFPs do what I did earlier in my demonstration of the ESFP tarot read. And now, yeah, now you're saying you're already, yeah, it's like you are just an absolute, um, I, I, there are two possibilities. Either you are genuinely that self-deceptive and genuinely that unwilling to acknowledge the truth because in no way, shape or form have you established that the demarcation line, that the evidence lands on the side of uh, 
by Jobini SFP. In fact, you've acknowledged that all the evidence we've talked about supports NTJ. But the lack of quantitative NI cues you in on the fact that she's ESFP, right? Is that what you are saying? Okay, but that doesn't... What you're saying is ESFPs can look a lot like INTJs when they're doing YouTube. That doesn't mean this individual who looks like a lot like an NTJ is an ESFP. That's not an argument in favor of her being one. Do you not understand that? Do you, do you not understand that or are you being stubborn? Yeah, I agree. It's tiresome. I'm done. You're you don't qualify as a human whose whose expression deserves to be heard because you don't listen and respond to what people say. You ignore what I said. You've acknowledged nothing. You've grown not at all. You've moved not one inch, and you're stubbornly wrong. Despite that, um, at that point it becomes uh, rancor, spite. So you are now hidden from the channel. Yeto is an ESFP with a crush on Lijo, so wants Lijo to be ESFP too. Probably. Regardless, everybody has a responsibility to to be to be honest to some extent, right? Like, for example, when he pointed out that he had already answered it, I just had missed it in the live chat. I said, "I stand corrected. I was wrong. You did already answer it. My bad." Everybody has a responsibility to do that. Did you hear any of that from her, from that person about anything? No. So we know right away, since I won plenty of points and they had plenty of opportunities to respond in that fashion, that that person doesn't have human level communication. They've got subhuman level communication. Communication means two parties listen to each other, understand each other, and respond as though they had been understood. And if they can't do that, then they're, I don't consider them human beings. SI polar can endure physical pain. Cheese. I'm eating plenty of cheese. grown-ups know they're not always right and are willing to change their perspective when there are good reasons to do so. Oh, Rachel, would you mind doing that? Looking on the oh, porch yeah. for a package? Sure, sure. If you don't want it, if you're comfortable, don't worry about it. We'll get it later. I hope someone else would bring it to us. <laughs> My dad probably will. It's so hot outside, I don't want Okay, I'll do it. Um, you just got stung by five bees? Five of them, huh? Did, I mean, did you pee, did you piss off each of the bees individually, or did you piss them off as a group? Mm. Or did you go up to each bee and say things like, "Your stinger's dull," and the next one, "Your wings are ratty," and things like that, or did you just say, "Bees in general suck." Well, you know what they say, Waylon. 
If they look like bees and five of them stung you, they're bees, not wasps. Wasps don't gather in gangs like that. You go walk the indie dog. Is that different than a mainstream dog? Hmm. Did they surprise attack you? Did you have your katana with you? Did you try to chop them in half in the air? Look, I will do DMT again, maybe next week or something. I don't know. But, uh, and next time I will try to do more. I'll try to do four hits or five hits or whatever, because while I, I know I got through the breakthrough range, I, what I don't know is if there's another level breakthrough above that, maybe, which there might be. Um, but the thing is to remember... What is it that people expect to happen when you do enough DMT? Well, they expect you to come back and say certain words, right? If they're watching you while you're doing it, it's happening, they may expect to see you uh, incapacitated, unable to speak for a while or something. Uh, that's possible. I, I could get there. The thing is, what I hear about it, there being entities you can talk to, is the thing that intrigues me most about it. I would like to meet one of these so-called entities and engage in some sort of communication with them. <coughs> but what would it what would it mean if I were to come back and say yes, I've talked to those entities and. Um, they are just entities distinct from you outside of yourself. Well, it would mean that certainly I perceived them as such that it didn't seem to me while I was on that drug that that was my own brain talking to me, right? It seemed like distinct entities. But I don't have that much faith in my own perception, right? So it's like, my takeaway would be, wow, I met what seemed to my perceptions to be distinct entities and had this engagement with them. That's an interesting effect of the drug. I, I still wouldn't come back and say magical bullshit about it, right? It seems very unlikely that whatever entities you encounter when you're on an DMT are actually distinct entities outside of yourself because after all, well, if they're outside of yourself in physical space, then they must be only visible to you when you're on DMT and that explanation is the same as just in your head, right? So in other words, there's no, because there's no way to verify from the outside that when you smoke that DMT, these entities appeared, there's no way to link the externality in any way that doesn't include the DMT. Why do people always say the same entity, see the same entities on their trip? Would somebody not use, using the shaman to pre-educate themselves or learn also see the same figures entities? Um, I mean, we don't know that people necessarily see the same entities. I did see a good video on hyperbolic geometries, which is basically within our visual field, there appears to be an inherent capacity to represent space with geometry. We think of it as being a purely cerebral affair that when we represent space mathematically via geometry, 
we are doing something that uh, is unrelated in some sense to what we see. But the fact is, uh, hyperbolic geometry is the idea of mapping curved spaces using uh, angled sh angled shapes and circular shapes and stuff using shapes um, is part of math as well and basically our eyes are doing that they're doing that math on the visual level of dividing the objects into maps of hyperbolic geometries so if in fact the entities are the same because they all look the same then sort of fractal geometries would explain why they all look the same if they're the same because they all identify themselves by the same name or something like let's say you could you could have somebody take DMT and say okay the elf number one is named blue ears and then on the other side of the world, somebody who doesn't even speak English, take DMT, never heard of this at all before, and come out and say, Elf number one is named Blue Ears? Okay, now, now you're on to something. Now we're talking about something that's a convincing piece of evidence that something weird's going on, right? But appearance and identity are different things. So that everybody would see something in basically the same kind of hyperbolic geometry fractal image uh, that's to be expected as a commonality in terms of impact of the drug other markers of identity however if those were always the same and they were non-visual and non-mathematical but rather sort of personality linked or um, if in fact entities were giving you pieces of knowledge that were you had no way that you did not know had no way of knowing but had a way of verifying after the fact that would be a good test. Like, I don't currently know uh, who won yesterday's Dodger game. If I could take DMT and have an entity communicate to me that information and I could check it, look it up and see who won yesterday's Dodger game and the entity be right and tell me the score and everything. Okay, now we're on to something, right? So the thing about magical stuff is the number one thing to remember about magical stuff is that um, if it's magic, let's use it. Of course, that means we have to actually test it. And when you actually test it, you realize it's not magic. So I got to stop this stream because I got stuff coming up here in a little bit. And uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to remind everybody, when you think you see magic in your life, it's really just boring old normal shit. Thanks for watching. Sorry to be a wet blanket. <laughs> I'm in a wet blankety mood, I guess, the last few days. Can you be in a wet blanket mood? Is that an emotion? Wet blanket? Blanket wetness? I love you all, and there's nothing non-magical about that.